Thanks for joining us. My name is Jason Fisk. I'm the executive director of UCLA School of Law's Master of Legal Studies program. So this is the general information session and designed for those who are looking just to gain some more information about the Master of Legal Studies program to see if it's the right fit for you. And in case you're uh, not familiar with UCLA, UCLA is the number one public university in America and is the number one law school as ranked by US News and World Reports in Southern California. A few things about uh, the impact the UCLA, uh, a UCLA credential can have is the network that it provides for you. So there's uh, 365,000 UCLA alums that are located in California. There's alums located in all 50 states and five territories. They are located in 146 different countries throughout the world. And it's truly that wherever you go in your career, whether it be today or tomorrow or in the future, that this, the network follows you. So uh, if you're planning on staying in Los Angeles, if you're planning to go somewhere else in California or some, somewhere through the country, the networks and connections gained through this program uh, will continue with you through the rest of your career. If you're not familiar with Los Angeles, Los Angeles is a spectacular place to, to live, learn, and grow as an individual. And it also has great employment opportunities in all sectors, whether you're looking for the entertainment sector, uh, employment law, as far as there's just enormous amounts of companies. It's the second largest city in the United States with a very diverse economy that is also an international city that has uh, people from all over the world that have found their way to this beautiful location. So I'm sure you know about the natural beauty, the beaches, and uh, the hiking, uh, but it's also uh, California in general, and, and especially Los Angeles, you can literally drive to the mountains in the morning, go skiing, and then in the afternoon, drive down to the beach and go surfing, if, if you so chose for, for any particular day. That's the proximity that Los Angeles provides, which I think is a pretty interesting place based on its location. Now, specifically about the Master of Legal Studies degree here at the law school. So when this degree was created, um, uh, it was the faculty started developing it about four or five years ago. And they looked at the landscape and they saw that for all of time that the top legal education in the land from schools like UCLA have only been offered to those who want to be lawyers. And so if you don't want to be a JD, then too bad, you're out. And but they knew that there's so many more types of people who would benefit from this type of education from this kind of school. And so then that's when the faculty developed this Master of Legal Studies degree with that in mind, knowing that the working professionals just don't have the time to do a JD, that a three-year full-time commitment for someone who's not interested in being a lawyer is just not a realistic thing. And so that's where this degree fits in. So it's designed for working professionals, but we also, we also of course have people who come right out of undergraduate who don't wanna be lawyers, who wanna learn about the law, but lots of working professionals who, where this degree is designed for you. Now, why the degree, so that's why the faculty developed it, but some people, have told us some other reasons as well. So such as the entire structure of the economy and government is based on laws. So whether you're running a gov whether you're running a business entity, whether you work for the government, you work for a nonprofit, you, the law touches everything. And so having a much more thorough grounded foundation in the law is going to benefit you in virtually all sectors. It also, the degree is designed to help you think like a lawyer without being a lawyer. And so then if you, you get, if you, you, know, you lead a company, if you're high up in the entertainment industry, if you work in human resources and health, you know, whatever it is, having a stronger ability to understand the language of the law is going to be immensely beneficial. So maybe you communicate with lawyers regularly and you just feel like, man, I just feel like whatever they say, I'm kind of just forced to do because I don't understand everything that they're talking about. So this degree would really help you to really be able to stand your ground more and help lead more effectively and uh, communicate more effectively with more people, including lawyers. 
Many people also are looking to gain specific legal knowledge. So maybe there's more you need to know about environmental regulations or um, human resource guidelines lines in employment and labor law. Uh, maybe there's some health uh, different uh, HIPAA compliance and types of things you're looking to gain a much more thorough understanding on. All of these different things uh, is a great way to gain more specific legal knowledge in a topic of, of your choosing. Also, many people on a regular basis deal with contracts, IP deals, employment agreements, all of these different things are all the law. And so then this program really allows you to much more effectively handle these types of things because you currently, maybe you're looking at the four corners of that contract or whatnot, and you're thinking, and you're only able to kind of minimally analyze it based on what's in front of you. But this program would open up the world to you as far as what's possible to do with these types of documents and whatnot, which may help you really take things to the next level. And we mentioned this before, but to be able to communicate more effectively with lawyers. So those are a lot of the most common uh, reasons that we have our prospective students uh, come in and be interested in our program. So about a little bit now into the nitty gritty. So talking about the details of the program. So there, this is you know one program, it's the Master of Legal Studies, but there are two options on how to complete this degree. So the first option is the full-time program. So this is a nine month program. So you can start in an August semester and complete in May, nine months and, and you're done. And so some people like that kind of speed that you can do the degree in and it's, most people are, who are attracted to it are, you know, recent graduates are those who are looking to have an F1 visa to come in to study. And for those with flexibility to take some time off work, take a sabbatical. This last year, we had a couple students who have full-time employment, but they just said, you know, I, for personal growth reasons, I just want to come in and knock this thing out and really focus on personal growth for these nine months and took a sabbatical. And so that's what some people are doing and who's attracted to the full-time program. Now, the other option, and certainly our mo most popular option, is the part-time program. This is anywhere from two to four years in length, depending on how many classes you want to take each semester. It's designed for executives and working professionals with full-time employment. So those who uh, do it on a, a two-year pace, you can expect the work both in class and out of class combined to be right around 20 hours of work a week. If you do it instead on a four-year pace, you're more at like eight to 10 hours of work on week on a week on average. So again, you're not, you're not locked into anything. You're not saying, oh, I'm doing the two-year program, a four-year program. Each semester is an independent decision. So maybe you say this semester, you know, I've got a little, little extra time, work is lightened up. Let's do, let's do like a, more units. And that would pace you more towards two years. If instead you're like, man, I'm slammed this semester, then okay, just, you know, just, just take one class. And then that would pace you more towards four years if you kept that up. But if you mix and match, then you'll be somewhere in between. But that just to give you a sense of what the time commitment is for the program. Now, the classes are scheduled such that uh, for the part-time program that the core curriculum is the first part of the program, which I'll talk a little bit more in a few minutes. But the core curriculum is in the evenings, Tuesday, Thursday, Tuesday night starts at 6.30, ends at 9.30, and it's on campus, assuming, you know, assuming coronavirus allows for that. Then Thursday night, same time, 6.30 to 9.30, back-to-back -back classes, same as Tuesday, uh, but it's online. So it's meeting online instead of in person. So that's, that's what the schedule can be. So it's one time a week on campus, starting at 6.30 p.m. It's, uh, that'd be the first year of the program. That would be your schedule. Now for the second year of the program, that's when you get into the specialization stage and you can choose from an array of electives that the law school offers. We will have classes that are exclusively online and in the evenings, if you just wanna do those ones. We have uh, other options that are on campus, residential that are meet, would, might meet a couple weeks a day. I mean, a couple <laughs> to a couple days a week. And so if you prefer that option, then that's, that's available for you as well. So it, or mix and matching between the two. So that, that's, uh, that's the gist of what you can expect as far as the, the scheduling is concerned. Now, so we have one thing that we're really proud of is our current students in the program. This is a brand new program. The first incoming class was this last August, 2020. So thus we're now talking to students about our second incoming class, August, 2021. And so that it's, so again, very exciting. Uh, but we've surveyed our students, our current students, and asked them, you know, describe the program for us in one word. And so the words that came up most frequently are these, 
the, the top word is some iteration of it's challenging. The, the program is, you know, it's at a top law school. So of course the classes are very rigorous, but would you want it any other way? Would, would you want easy classes? No, no, this is, this is a program for personal growth. One that you'll, uh, for lifelong learners. So thus you want, you should want to be challenged. And so thus, and it is a challenging experience, but with that challenging bonds, the students together. So they, they, there's a lot of support amongst the existing students uh, for, for each other and help, you know, bond each other to each other. Uh, and that, so that's the a second word that comes up frequently is camaraderie, that people really feel connected with each other because it's a challenging program. Then third is fun. So this is unlike maybe when you did undergraduate or maybe a past degree or whatnot, you're doing the past degrees, you're doing it for the degree. Right. So if a lot of people you're in college, like, well, I have to meet certain number of units. Maybe you like some of the classes. Maybe you don't like other ones. This degree, you're doing it because you see specific benefits for it. And so that leads for a different type of student who's in the classroom. You're not necessarily just doing it for the degree. You're doing it to learn. You know, it's, it's, that's kind of weird, isn't it? But yet it's the truth. And so thus, that's fun. You're, you're picking topics that you want to study. And so thus people are have described it as fun. Now the uh, the job level of the, our uh, our existing incoming class from this last year, what we see a range. We see a range of individuals. So we certainly have uh, recent graduates. We have CEOs, vice presidents, director managers. It's intentionally diverse. It's diverse on a huge range. We have diverse uh, backgrounds as far as education, diverse as far as uh, job position, diverse as far as race and ethnicity. Uh, gender. We have like a whole range and it's a very diverse class and we intentionally make it so. And that leads to a very dynamic classroom envir environment having those types of backgrounds uh, come together. Now we also, given that diversity, we have a huge range of different companies and organizations ranging from private sector to nonprofit to government all together in one incoming class. You know, we have people who work for uh, UCLA, we have LA Times Reporter, we have someone who works for Sony Pictures, DC Entertainment, we have uh, people who work in the, uh, you know, in, our, in the human resources field, we have X, FX Networks, we have all of these different companies making it very interesting. You know, we have people who work for, for the county, for the city, uh, just a very nice background of, of individuals uh, that I know any of you would be able to, to fit in very nicely. Now quickly profiling just a few of the actual students who are in our program. So there's uh, Michelle Edgar. So she's in our entertainment and media law specialization. So she's the VP of brand marketing at Epic Records. She says why she did it. She says, uh, this will be an invaluable in my career trajectory and advancement as I further my passion to impact change in my industry. We have uh, Megan Johnson, who's in our employment and human resources law specialization. She's the VP of Human Resources at STX Entertainment. She said she's doing it uh, to become a greater expert in my field and for my company, and that she's doing it to challenge herself. We have uh, Joseph Littlefield, who's the VP of Supply Chain at Athletic Green. He said he's doing it to further my ability to speak law plus for personal growth. So those are examples of a few of our students. Those were coincidentally all VPs, but... Uh, certainly we have, like I said, we have people coming right out of college. We have directors, we have associate directors. We have like, you know, we have a range of individuals in the program. Now, as far as the degree requirements, it's, as I alluded to before, it starts with our required foundational courses. This is called our core curriculum. Now the core curriculum comprises of five courses that are exclusively designed by the UCLA law faculty for this MLS program. And as I mentioned before, these are offered in the evenings, on weeknights with Tuesday nights being on, on campus, 6.30, 9.30, and then Thursday night being online. Then the second phase of the program are the elective courses, our specialization phase, where you can choose a specialization if you'd like. And those ones were, is where you can select from over 200 courses from the UCLA Law Curriculum. And as I mentioned before, there's online ones that are available in the evenings, uh, but there's also different uh, courses that are residentially offered on, on the campus, ranging in time from the morning, afternoon, to into the evening. Then to complete the program, we have the Capstone Seminar. The Capstone Seminar allows students to deeply engage with issues relevant to their career focus or intellectual uh, interest. 
The program is 26 units to complete at least, though you're able to go beyond that and many students elect to do that because especially once they get into the elective phase, there's just so many different classes available that many cho are choosing to stay on quite a bit past the 26. But if you're looking just for the minimum required, it's 26, which of course a lot of people end up doing. Now, a little bit about the specializations available. So there's eight specializations, starting with business law. Business law is our most popular and most flexible specialization because there's just a lot of different topic areas that fit into it. Maybe you're interested in real estate. Maybe you're interested in finance, wealth management. Maybe you want to do a little bit of tax. Maybe you're interested in compliance. All of these things and much more are all fit well, fit right into the business law specialization. So it's a very flexible de degree, uh, degree specialization. So the second one is employment and human resources law. So this is our uh, our second most popular specialization tied with the, the next one, entertainment law. But employment and human resources is naturally for you, most people who do it are in human resources. So what, uh, whether you're looking to get into human resources or you're already in it, this is, this is the place for you. You'll study lots of employment law issues, labor law, um, employment discrimination, all sorts of things that are very beneficial for your, uh, the advancement of your career. Now, third is entertainment and media law. So again, the employment and entertainment are our two second most popularizations, specializations. Entertainment and media law, you get a huge range of issues. And you know, we are ranked number one in the country in entertainment law, not surprising given our location and proximity to Hollywood. But that just really allows us to draw on the talent of Hollywood and bring it right in to you as students in our program. So there's a wide range of classes that are offered. But examples of those would be entertainment law. There's several classes on IP, such as copyrights, trademarks, uh, classes of those sorts. There's there's uh, classes on uh, Hollywood guilds and all you know just a range of things that, that our students are finding quite interesting. Fourth is environmental law. Fifth is government and national security law. Another uh, pretty popular specialization of ours. Health law and policy. One that you know, makes an enormous amount of sense that a law school does this program for as a master's degree as there's just so many people that could really benefit from that kind of knowledge uh, as, as a massively regulated industry. We have nurses, we have doctors, we have people who do quality control at, at hospitals and, and medical centers and such that are all kind of drawn to that uh, specialization. We have law and technology tech uh, specialization. This is a uh, one that's growing in popularity. So in this one, there's a lot of, there's a few angles you can take this. There's people in cybersecurity and data privacy who, who are kind of gravitate towards this. There's people who are looking to learn a lot more about IP, a lot more about the, the, the you know, what we call future law. So that's how is the law gonna develop and adapt to technology. So these are the types of classes that you can expect in law and technology specialization. Uh, public interest law. We this is as far as curriculum goes. The business law is the most flexible as far as topics, but the public interest law is the most is the most robust as far as topic as far as classes available. Because as a public university, uh, UCLA is very dedicated to the public interest, and so the law school has gone all in in this field. And so we see several different people applying a very popular popular specialization for us in a wide range of areas. So we have social workers, we have people who work at a nonprofits, we have uh, journalists, lots of journalists who are very interested in, in coming uh, to our program. So there's lots of different areas that you can do uh, within the public interest law. Then finally, the last two options are if you, uh, some people just aren't able to choose just one, want to do kind of mix and match two different ones, or uh, so you can just do general studies. If you're like, man, you know, I'm an HR official, but I'm going to start a consulting business. I want to do some business law too. Or I'm a doctor and I want a little bit more about health law and HIPAA and whatnot. But I also want to know about running my business. Let's do a business law. So there's lots of kind of, you know, mix and matches that work very nicely. Just do general studies then. Then you can, then you have no limitation. It's the ultimate flexible. You can choose absolutely any course you want uh, in the specialization stage for general. Self-designed is people who kind of look at the curriculum overall and say, I want to really specialize in this, but that's not one of your options, eight options. So we have people who are like, I want to do immigration. I want to do like that kind of thing. So if, if you see, if you mix and match and see an option, you can propose it 
And if it's unique and well-structured in the classes that we already offer, then you might be able to be approved for a self-designed specialization. Now, as far as tuition and scholarships for our program, the program is charged per unit uh, at 2,227 per unit. It is slated to go up, you know, a percentage point or two each year. So you can expect, you know, a minor adjustment uh, each year. Uh, but as far as how that breaks down for you, it's a 26 unit degree. And so if you spread that out, let's say over two years, which is the most popular option. So if you do it over two years, then you'd be looking at a total of, let's say about 14,000, between 14 to $15,000 of tuition per semester spread out over two years. Now, uh, if there is a scholarship that applies, which I'll talk about a little later, that is the Bruin scholarship, which is up to 20% off of tuition, which will lower that down uh, quite a bit from that, from that $14,000 semester mark. And there are additionally some uh, university level fees which can apply each semester that will likely range between eight to $900 a semester or so. Now, scholarships that are available, I mentioned one already, the Bruin Scholarship. This is one of the ones that no application required. Every candidate is automatically considered for it. And so how do you earn this and how do you get it? So you can get up to 20% off of tuition and there's two primary factors that are that are that we look at as far as to award what level of scholarship to award. So one is the strength of the academic background of the individual. Where did you go to school? How did you do there? Secondly, is uh, the work history of the individual. What is your position? What are your accomplishments? What's your responsibility level? We kind of balance those two things, and that will determine your level of Bruin scholarship. Not coincidentally, that's also the two factors we look at for admission. And so that's, we look, uh, it's one and the same. And so that's how we uh, judge the level of Bruin scholarship. Secondly, is uh, UC or CSU staff scholarship. So if you're a staff or work full time, so as a professor or something, then uh, you would qualify for this. This is automatic and you're, and you're given the scholarship automatically. And if you get this one, you're not eligible for the Bruin scholarship. And, but it would essentially replace that, that scholarship and it's automatic. Now, there's a couple of scholarships which can be on top of the Bruin Scholarship or the UCCSU Scholarship. And these ones applications are required. And so you would just upload a document when you apply, uh, including one that just says like Blue and Gold Scholarship application. And then you would say why you should get it. Now the Blue and Gold Scholarship is our needs-based uh, scholarship. And it's essentially you would outline why is there an extraordinary circumstance that would lead to unique financial needs for you and that will then uh, determine if you can receive the, uh, an amount for the blue and gold scholarship. As our program is all about access and it's about excellence. And so we want everyone to be able to access this type of education despite uh, prohibitive financial circumstances. So that's important to us as a public university. And excellence is of course, we want to do everything at the highest level that we possibly can. So that's the blue and gold scholarship. Secondly, is the government and nonprofit leader scholarship. So if you work for the government, if you work for a nonprofit, uh, talk about how this degree is gonna impact the government or impact the nonprofit that you're working for uh, because of education and how you're, you're gonna be able to impact it through this education. Then you can uh, potentially earn a scholarship that's, it, again, in addition to the Bruin scholarship, um, if, if you can explain that in, in an uploaded document. Now, funding options. So, of course, there's uh, several options here. So, it is, you know, accredited program, obviously. And so, you can have uh, federal financial aid for federal loans, private loans. Some have employer reimbursement. Uh, some you can use veteran benefits on the program. So, those are some funding options. Of course, there's also self pay. You can set up payment plans and such um, if you so choose. Now, as far as the application is concerned, there's a separate video that is all about application tips. And so that one is ve gets very specific on this and strategic on how to make yourself shine the most. So I suggest watching that video if you're so interested. Uh, but here's the kind of general overview of what you can expect. So first you'd go and request the application on, on our website. That, then you'd be sent the link, which will you'll then be able to create an account and uh, start your application. You would need transcripts. We suggest e-transcripts from your education. You would upload a resume. 
you'd write a statement of purpose and personal statement. So the statement of purpose is what's the reason for you doing this, uh, this degree? What's the purpose? And the personal statement is like your story. How did you become who you are today? Did you overcome any adversity? That kind of thing. You need at least two letters of recommendation. If you're an international applicant, you need both the transcript evaluation and translation if it's not in English, and also an English language test if you uh, did education that wasn't in English or from a country not where English is not the primary language. You can always email us and ask us if you have questions about if, if you need to do any of these things. So you can email us at mls at law.ucla.edu. Standardized test is not required for this program. So it is not required for this program. However, you can, if you'd like, submit a GRE, GMAT, LSAT, it doesn't matter to us, one of the standardized tests if you really, if you want to try to strengthen and bolster your uh, academic background side of the equation. So again, for the upcoming, the upcoming uh, application deadline, I have the wrong uh, date down here. Sorry about that. April 26th is the general application deadline. And so that's what's coming up. Now, as far as next steps for you, uh, you can schedule a call to admissions advisor. I would also suggest if you haven't already, fill out a contact form. Then we can send you our e-brochure. We can, uh, you can start receiving a couple different emails with uh, detailed information about the program and upcoming deadlines. So those are a couple of things. Submit a, submit a contact form. You can schedule a call and you can start your application. You can uh, start or finish your application uh, through, through the UCLA Graduate Divisions page. So thank you so much for taking the time to watch this information session. I hope you found it helpful and I hope to connect you, with you soon and I hope to see you in the incoming class in August. Hope you have a great rest of your day.